All right, everyone, let's talk about Halloween H2O 20 years later. Halloween 5 and 6 was terrible, but this one is not. This is a damn good movie. <clears throat> this is a perfect, you know, this movie acts as the real Halloween 3. And I'm going to consider this to be more like the Laurie Strode, at this being the final chapter of what I call the Laurie Strode trilogy. You know, because, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis does come back, and Jamie Lee Curtis being back just gives this movie much needed credibility, because without Jamie Lee Curtis, I mean, you still had Donald Pleasance in 4, 5, and 6, and 4 is great, but 5 and 6 were terrible in terms of directioning, in terms of writing mostly, because the writing in those two movies were fucking god-awful. And the movie, the series was losing credibility by a landslide. Thankfully, Jamie Lee Curtis... You know, wanted to do this, which was great. She had a pet. You know, this movie was shot with a lot of, you know, was a lot of passion, with some good talent. You know, you had Steve Miner who worked on the first three Friday the Thirteenth films, so he has a horror pedigree. Because he now, no one doesn't have a horror pedigree. He actually directed parts two and three of the Friday the Thirteenth movies. So him coming off for Halloween was awesome because you have a proven horror director who knows his shit, and you have Jamie Lee Curtis who has come into this movie <clears throat> as who is passionate about making this movie and wants to do it and we, we got it and it was made and they did a good job with it to me H2O is like is the scream of the Halloween films this is a fresh take on Halloween this is the Halloween of the mid to late 90s you know it's you know it's got it got an energy to it it's got a hipness a little bit to it it's got some it's got some you know energetic characters you know, you got Josh Hartman who plays Laurie's son. We, Josh Hartman did a pretty good job, you know, with what he was given. I like the little chemistry he and Jamie Lee had, actually. Um, you got L.O. Kuja who plays a security guard. And I always liked L.L. as an actor. I thought, I thought he was pretty funny. And I like his character as a security guard. Um, I don't really care for the stuff with his wife when they keep arguing on the phone because L.O. wants to be an actor and stuff like, wants to be a writer and stuff like that. So I thought the stuff with his wife was kind of, you know, just... You know, it was okay, funny in areas, but just like, okay, no, stop. I would have liked it better if LL, you know, had more character interactions with, you know, with Lori and her son instead of being on a phone for most of the time. I think, I think that's what's missing with his character, that he need, I needed more of a connection between him, Lori, and uh, her son since they're old, <clears throat> since, you know, since Lori's son has a history of sneaking off school grounds. <clears throat> But that's neither here nor there. Uh, you got Michelle Williams who plays you know, Josh Hartnett's uh, girlfriend. And, jo and Michelle Williams is just a very, very, very good-looking girl next door. She and she's and she was a and she's a decent actress in this movie too. She did a good job. I I, I can buy her and Hartnett being you know lovers in this thing. <clears throat> um, and of course you know Michael is back to being his glory from Halloween one. You know, he's not a bitch, as he was in Halloween 5 and 6. He's The court, the, the track has been set with Michael. He's back to being a stone-cold motherfucker killer. The opening prologue of this movie is great. You know, we bring back Marion Whittington, played by Nancy Stevens, who was in Halloween's 1 and 2. We get a really cool prologue with the nice, with the really cool orchestral version of the Halloween theme, which immediately sets the tone that this is going to be a somewhat, you know, grandish movie with a musical, like a full musical orchestral score. Which I thought John Ottman, the composer, did a great job with. Uh, and again, you have a director who knows what he's doing in Steve Miner. And you got a story, which is... Which is cool. The story of this movie is... This is the, the movie... We are 20 years to the anniversary of the Halloween killings. And Lori finding out the revelation that she is Michael's sister. And she's... A character who is very damaged. You know, she has not gotten over the events of what happened 20 years prior. She still thinks. She still thinks in her mind she sees Michael. She's still haunted by those events. And I like it. I like it a lot. It shows just how damaged she is to the point where she had to fake her death and change her name just so that her brother wouldn't find her. It's just awesome, cool stuff that we gave, gave us. And I also like the little parallel of me between Frankenstein and Michael, which I thought, was, which I thought was pretty cool too. And you do get some good suspenseful kills. 
and you got some good suspenseful scenes. You got some wasted scenes, like a scene where Michael Steel pretty much steals a woman's car keys. The movie wasted two or three minutes with this. I mean, it's not a bad scene, direction-wise, but it's filler. All these characters don't mean nothing to the overall plot. You could have easily taken this out and moved on. <clears throat> But you got some other kills too, you know. And a lot of these kills mostly involve just simple stabbing. Uh, and a lot of the kills also appear in the aftermath. Like, this movie gave us Joseph Gordon Levett, one of my favorite actors. And you see him in the beginning, and then you, a few minutes later, when you see him again, he has a he has a roller, he has like an ice skate, you know, shoved in his face. And you don't see Michael do it, it's just the aftermath, which I think is more suspenseful and is much more. Uh, well, that's the word I'm looking for. Much more visceral than actually seeing the death happen. It's just like, just being, just seeing, like, a dead body. It's just like, whoa, just pops right at you, which I thought was pretty cool. And I think makes for a really, I think make for better directed jump scares, in my opinion. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I got to say about that. Now, let's go on to the juicy stuff, which is pretty much the whole last half of this movie, the big chase. And... The thing I like about this chase the most is that Lori becomes the stalker. She becomes the hunter. She is on the hunt for Michael. She wants closure. She wants to, pretty much, she wants Michael to feel her pain, is how I get a read on it. And I love it. Michael and Lori have a balls out fucking slugfest. They're stabbing each other. Michael stabs Lori in the same arm where he did 20 years prior. You know. You got this really cool scene where Lori's in the kitchen throwing knives at Michael. Then you got this great scene where, like, she jumps out of a window and starts, like, stabbing Michael and dodging his shots. And then he then knocks her off a balcony. But prior to that, you got this really, really, really cool suspenseful scene where Lori's hiding under tables. And Michael's just ferociously pulling those tables back trying to get to Lori. Like, yeah. Like, the last 15 minutes of this movie, the last 20 minutes of this movie is just age of your seat. Roller coaster, cheer at the screen, awesomeness. And then you get this awesome scene where, like, okay, so Michael gets loaded onto this truck, this, you know, this more bus. Lori's like, uh uh, I'm driving this shit because I know he's still alive. And we're driving, she's driving, she's driving, she's driving, just waiting for Michael. Michael finally pops up to go get her. She stops short. Michael flies through the windshield. Lori just crashes right into him. The truck just loses, goes off, goes off a cliff or something. Goes, I'm sorry, goes off, like a, goes off the road. Lori gets knocked out of the truck. Michael gets pinned against a tree. Michael's in a vulnerable state. He has nowhere to go. Lori's busted. And then you get this very poignant moment where Michael reaches his hand out for Lori. And it's a, and it's, it, it did what Halloween failed, what Halloween 5 failed to do, which is create a genuine moment. It created a genuine moment between Lori and Michael. And it did it without having Michael cry like a little bitch. Michael, with that emotionless stare, just reaches his hand out for Lori. Is he asking for help? Or is he trying to trick her so we can get, get that final kill shot? We don't know. But Lori responds a little bit because she reaches her hand, her hand out too. And it's that genuine moment between a brother and a sister which I thought was awesome and still iconic every time I every time I think about it it's that that's that genuine hollow it's that genuine moment between a brother and a sister right before Lori does the kill shot and whacks Michael's head off with an axe the perfect ending to this movie by by every stretch of the imagination thank you Steve Miner thank you Jamie Lee Curtis for making a quality Halloween film since the fourth one when all said and done, Halloween H2O to me is an 8 out of 10. I love Jamie Lee Curtis. I like most of the cast members. I like Steve Miner's directing. F writing, for the most part, is pretty good. There are some side characters that I can do without, and there are some scenes that are just there for filler. But overall, this movie is really damn good and is a perfect movie to complete a different version of the Halloween franchise now, because now you can divide the franchise into different continuities. So to me, this is the perfect end to the Laurie Strode trilogy of movies. And that's all I got to say about that. My name is AJ Legend. Like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll check you back next time for more.